Just to be clear, this video will not be about artificial intelligence. Let's talk about Steve Jobs. <laughs> Despite this being a computer science channel, we all know what art is, and so I can spare you the video essay-esque prologue on cave paintings. At some point in art history though, around the time in which Jack Kirby was drawing the first Iron Man and Picasso was passing away, strides were being made towards a new medium of art. And by strides, I mean electron guns, because the medium was cathode ray tubes. Cathode ray tubes, or CRTs, were different from other tubes which were tubular. Instead, it was in the shape of a computer monitor with an electron gun at the back pointing outwards. The screen at the front was phosphorescent, which is Greek and Latin for when an electron beam from the electron gun hits a part of it, the part that is hit glows a certain color. If you're fine with being monochrome, this color is usually a paper white or green green. A single glowing spot on a screen doesn't really do anything though, so in order to invent something useful, the electron beam is Bent, usually by a magnetic force from an electromagnetic field, so that it scans across the screen at different intensities, going really quickly from one end of the screen to the other for every frame. Because of this scanning motion of phosphors lighting up across the CRT screen, if you were to place a light sensor somewhere on that screen, you would be able to compute the precise location of that sensor by just recording at what time a change in brightness is detected. And that is the fundamental idea behind the light pen, which isn't heavy, but it's called the light pen because it's light sensitive. By taking the time in which the change in brightness is detected from the light pen and comparing it to the times in which each point on the CRG screen is being beamed, you can calculate the exact row and column that the pen is pointing to. Back in the Cold War when it was invented, everything was much more military oriented and so they called it the light gun and used it for pointing at things on military airspace surveillance radars. It was then in 1963 that MIT sensible person Ivan Sutherland saw that this was clearly a pen, which is what it was. And after reading a 1945 article by Vannevar Bush about what if the internet existed but it was just Google Drive without Wi-Fi and it was called the Memex, invented the graphical user interface. Well, in order to construct a meaningful engineering drawing, we have to have... Sketchpad was Sutherland's 1963 PhD thesis, winning him the Turing Award in 1988 and the Kyoto Prize in 2012. Pablo Picasso passed away in 1973 when Sketchpad is started on the TX2 computer, its CRT monitor displays the letters INK, which stands for ink. This is not only a word, but because the light pen needs to be touched by a phosphor that is being currently beamed in order for the computer to know its position, touching this word on the CRT allows the initial coordinates of the pen to be calibrated. The position of the pen is then marked with a white cross and combined with the lens of the pen giving a wider field of view to detect the change in position relative to that cross can be periodically updated. With 20 bits to represent any of the millions of positions possible on the CRT display, it was said that a man could actually talk to a computer. The conversation would probably be about polygons, though. Remember when I said that the conversation would probably be about polygons? Because the tectoic crawled out of the ocean, therefore humans have 10 fingers, therefore early mechanical calculators had 10 columns of input, which allowed for a maximum of 10 digit numbers, which may or may not have influenced the design of early mainframe computers to accommodate for 10 decimal digit precision integers. The TX2 was a 36 bit system. You might have a 64 bit, or if you're the reason why there are two windows down the links, 32 bit computer. A 36 bit computer means that data is processed 36 consecutive consecutive ones and zeros at a time. This means that every time the 20 bits storing a position on the CRT display are processed, there are 16 bits storing not the position on the CRT display. Since those 16 bits are there, they can store an address, much like your home address, except instead of you and your loved ones living there, it's geometric properties. In other words, the remaining 16 bits point to information in another file about the line curve or shape that the dot being drawn is a part of. If the dot is just part of a singular straight line, for example, then the information would include the coordinates of the start and end of that line. The file containing this information, or the topological file, can then regenerate the file containing the dots on the screen, or the display file, 
every time a line curve or shape is added or changed. This sort of regeneration between two files allows for mathematical operations and further adjustments to be made to the shapes themselves rather than the less useful dot by dot display data, and the elements of this topological file is what Sutherland calls n component elements, or as the modern programmer in the 1990s would call, object-oriented programming, which is the idea that everything is a thing. Sketchpad was a demonstrative program on an experimental machine, and by 1975, judging from photographs of the TX2 without its CRT and light pen, would never be used again. In 1978, development began by Apple Computer Inc. on, that's right, the LISA, which stands for Locally Integrated Software Architecture, which is a lot of words that mean computer, and also LISA. The Apple LISA was famous for having no one know about it, selling only 10,000 units, which is almost one bug island for the Wii. It did, however, in collaboration with Xerox and its Palo Alto Research Center, have a new peripheral called the mouse. In fact, the Apple LISA was heavily inspired by the Xerox Alto, which had windows, as in the rectangles with stuff in them, and so there was a lot of functionality involving clicking things and moving them around. This was the perfect backdrop for Lisa's drawing software, Lisa Draw, allowing you to draw on your Lisa, although it was marketed for drawing diagrams. And so this list of tools included lines, curves, ovals, text, polygons, as well as rounded corners, because Apple products without rounded corners are killed. The Lisa released in 1983, but just a year later was the Super Bowl, which actually happens every year. But during the 1984 Super Bowl, Apple announced the Macintosh. Microsoft DOS is just like the book 1984. The Apple Macintosh has a black and white monochrome CRT, but it's set to a fixed resolution of 512 by 342 quote unquote pixels. Like most graphical computers at this point, these pixels are represented in memory. No need for individual display files storing the X and Y coordinates of every single dot instruction, but instead you can store the entire contents of your screen into your RAM, which is your easily accessible temporary memory. For a monochrome screen like the Macintosh's, colors can be represented by a single bit, 0 or 1 for black or white. The state of a 512 by 342 pixel screen can thus be represented by 512 times 342 bits. These bits in the video memory can then be looked at and modified by the processor while also being fed to the screen 16 bits at a time almost a million times a second. With the positions on the screen represented by positions in memory, drawing a dot is as simple as writing a 1 or a 0. The real genius of Macintosh, Apple's newest personal computer, isn't its 32-bit microprocessor, or that it captures the power of a mainframe on a board 10 by 10 inches, or even that it costs half as much as computers half as powerful. The real genius of Macintosh is- If you can draw a dot, then you can draw a line, because a line is just a bunch of dots in a line. A horizontal line is a bunch of dots in a row, and a vertical line is a bunch of dots in every row. These two algorithms were both included in the core graphic software library LisaGraph for the Apple Lisa, later on renamed to QuickDraw after development continued on the Macintosh. The developer of LisaGraph and QuickDraw, Bill Atkinson, envisioned an area in which graphics could be drawn as an object which he calls a graph port. A few of the important variables of graph port are port rect, which defines the boundary and coordinate system of that drawing area, and port bits, which is another object containing an address to the ones and zeros of the image inside. Thus, the data being sent to the screen is first represented by a collection of graph ports. On a graph port, the algorithm to draw a skewed line is a bit more complicated, given that it is on a grid of square pixels. And and so, a sort of Minecraft rooftop method is to be employed, or from what I can tell from these 600 lines of assembly code, a version of Bresenham's line algorithm. To put Bresenham's line algorithm in very simple terms, as the line goes forward in the x-axis, it can either choose to stay the same in the y-axis, 
or go down one pixel, depending on which one is closer to the slope. By messing around with the equation for a line, this decision can be computed fairly efficiently. And then by checking the sign of the slope, switching around the axis and switching around the start and end points, this algorithm can be generalized for any line. In the case of quick draw, the slanted line is described as slabs drawn top to bottom. Other basic elements are drawn with similar approximations. The arc, for example, is drawn by doing arc stuff. The entirety of the Lisa and Macintosh graphic systems were thus composed of these fundamental elements, much like Avatar The Last Airbender. Lines, rectangles, rounded rectangles, ovals, arcs, polygons, bitmaps, texts, and regions, which are like rapidly manipulatable bitmaps that can be any shape. I never watched Avatar. If those elements seemed familiar, then you probably passed shapes class, but also they were the same shapes used in Lisa Draw, as well as Mac Draw, which was made by the same developer, Mark Cutter. Both applications used vector graphics, meaning that a drawing directly represents a series of calls to quick draw. A drawing of a line is a single call to the draw line function on the Mac Draw graph port. As each shape is its own function, this makes it very easy to go back and delete or adjust previously drawn shapes. But because of this very structured interface, it didn't feel so much like drawing as it did diagramming. During the development of LisaGraph, however, Bill Atkinson was making his own drawing application, which he hoped would further take advantage of the underlying graphic system. This application would be called Sketchpad, which isn't very creative, but at least it's not something stupid like Procreate. It was only really used for Atkinson to test the LisaGraph code until it became a Macintosh application in which the name changed to Mac Sketch and then Mac Paint, because this is much closer to painting than sketching. Now, that was a lot about Apple, but what about one of the other companies that exist? Let's take a look at Microsoft. Paint for Windows 1.0, released on PC in 1985, was the competitor to Mac Paint. As you may recall, graphical data is stored and manipulated within the hardware of the computer, and so one way to make graphics more efficient is to just have better hardware, or add specialized hardware such as a video card. Apple, being the affordable option, did not do this. All the graphics were manipulated on the same RAM with the same CPU as all the other software on the computer. And yet, even with no hardware to Advantage, both MacDraw and MacPaint appear significantly faster than LisaDraw and Paint for Windows, which instead looks as if the lines are being hand-drawn and erased with each frame. Which is kind of what is actually happening, except the hand is software and the eraser is also software, and the software is Microsoft DOS. Rather than having to draw a whole drawing, Atkinson's solution allows us to draw three whole drawings. Besides the bitmap that gets set to the graph port, there are two other bitmaps at all times in the Mac Paint program. On one off-screen bitmap is where the drawing happens, and so the bit-by-bit -bit drawing algorithms aren't shown. The other bitmap holds the previous state, allowing us to quickly redraw things, such as when we are setting the size of a circle. All of this, combined with quick drawing algorithms on the quick draw side, give Mac Paint the incredible feature of being usable. These buffers also make it very easy to implement one level of undo, allowing you to have flaws. Mac Draw presumably does something similar. Having the code and data for one feature also implement another feature is a big part of the memory efficiency of Mac Paint. When Atkinson began work on Mac Paint, he noticed that under Quick Draw, the fixed resolution physical screen is a raster because that's what he did. That is to say, the actual thing you are looking at is a grid of pixels. So why deal with conceptual phenomena such as adjustable lines and circles when you can deal with everything as it is? Mac Paint used raster graphics which is to say that whenever a shape was drawn in quick draw, the bits drawn were copied into part of one of the bitmaps. The image created is thus simply the final bitmap. Besides the familiar shapes, Atkinson also devised a few raster-specific tools such as brush, spray paint, and area fill. Only one paper-sized document could be opened at a time, and because of the exact size of the bitmap, the viewport was always zoomed in by the same amount and had to be dragged around. Since there was no zooming in, there was fat bits for pixel by pixel editing. Both fat bits and the option to show the entire page, by the way, were in a tab called goodies because they were 
having fun, and also it had to be renamed from AIDS. The raster graphics system, however, does have a critical problem. If you're not storing which pixel belongs to which shape, like in Sutherland's sketchpad, nor are you just making the entire picture directly a sequence of calls to quickdraw, like in MacDraw, then how do you adjust or change something once it's already been copied to the raster? Because the CRT of the Macintosh scans across the screen, so therefore the bits in memory represent it one row at a time, the region shape of QuickDraw can very efficiently store any shape by just checking at what point in each row is the color changing. Having a region be represented by a collection of reversal points makes it very compact and easy to operate with, for say if you want to overlay a region on top of another region. These regions built into the QuickDraw library are pivotal for the Macintosh's ability to have multiple multiple windows open. In fact, since many quickdraw drawing algorithms such as Bresenham's line algorithm already do things row by row, regions are very good and very fast at doing many things across the graphical applications of the Macintosh. In the case of MacPaint, the use of regions is very clear. Reusing the same code that the area fill tool uses to shrink a region around a black selection, the lasso tool then takes the lassoed bits within its region and copies them into another, separate from the other three, off screen bitmap. That off-screen bitmap, which is only in the program when something is being selected, can then be masked onto the on-screen bitmap, where it can then be dragged, inverted, filled, cut, copied, pasted, and cleared, just like a real lasso. MacDraw and MacPaint laid the foundations for vector and raster drawing applications. For all the Adobe fans out there, Illustrator was released in 1987, which created PostScript files, a sort of vector image that can be fed directly into your laser writer laser printer. Adobe would later on acquire and release Photoshop for Macintosh, the raster cousin to Illustrator, in 1990. Technology makes it difficult, maybe even impossible, to tell what's real, and what's not? And with the 90s came the World Wide Web. All of a sudden, people were no longer constrained to the vicinities of their laser writer, but rather could have the entire world see the image that they downloaded from someone else. Photoshop was still Photoshop, and so GIMP was released in 1995 as a non-Adobe Photoshop, and Krita was released in 2005 as a non-GIMP GIMP. The modern drawing application workstation probably has layers, filters, masking, custom brushes, and magic wands, but all all of these evolved naturally from the standard tool panel set by MacPaint in 1984. These evolutions weren't because the software got significantly better though, rather the hardware got so good that the software no longer had a need to hyper-optimize or even optimize. You can have a hundred layers in a drawing simply because the memory can hold and the CPU or GPU can process a hundred bitmaps stacked on top of each other. Throughout the 90s, drawing software also lost its position as the bench mark for graphical processing power, instead being replaced by the new technology of three-dimensional graphics. A modern graphics library such as OpenGL thus prioritizes 3D rendering, with 2D as an afterthought. Everything is represented as a vector of vertices, and most of the methodologies of QuickDraw, including regions, have been abandoned and lost to time. That's right, this video has no employment value. As lifelong companions to humans, cats have been depicted in the art and folklore of cultures across Afro-Eurasia and eventually the world. Perhaps this can be partially due to our lack of creativity. Even our wildest mythological creatures just end up being remixes of things that exist. But while our minds may be what they are, we survive and excel through tool use and storytelling. In the world of art, this translates to our ability to develop styles. Something as regular as a cat can be conveyed in a manner that tells a story that was never told before. Perhaps it's not that it is a cat, but rather that the style gives it a new perspective on what is a cat. Every medium is a tool in which we can use to unlock new perspectives which may have not otherwise been realized. Graphite, oil, ink, photography, flip-a-clip. Each medium has a clear and direct influence between their physical properties and the genres, styles, and movements associated with them. American artist Susan Kerr created art through mediums such as mosaics and needlepoint, as well as with styles of painting such as pointillism. And yet when 
when she was commissioned to create the icons for the Macintosh using a modified version of the Fat Bits function of Mac Paint, she sketched the prototype by filling in grid paper. This style, developed from the medium which was the raster screen, was called pixel art. And just like raster graphics to pixel art, technologies put at the disposal of artists in drawing softwares has achieved styles unseen in traditional mediums through web comics, animations, video games, fan art, original characters, and so on. In an interview with Bill Atkinson, Atkinson stated that to him, his software is a form of art. Perhaps in the same sense, art is a form of innovation. And since we cannot draw anything other than cats, the forefront of artistry in the long term is styles unique to the medium, and in the short term, unique to yourself. How we apply technology determines if we want to enable that or take away from it. Technology will always make things more convenient, but for whom is it making things more convenient for is the application. The entire ethical debate on the direction that technology should take is honestly something that I can't say anything with certainty about. This is a video about cats. But when we look at digital art, we see technology being applied to create mediums which is to say technology by which styles can be developed from. The styles of digital art, which is the culmination of the styles of each individual digital artist, is the substance by which the golden age of artistic creation via the internet is built from. Cats indeed are very silly, but what could be sillier than to forget artistry for the sake of its own consumption?